My name is Mary Dana Abbott. I'm from Chicago. We moved there when I was three from Detroit. And I've been living in New York for the last 16 years. When I was 10 years old, my dad and I would go to yoga together at my local dance studio. And I would take it every Saturday afternoon, mainly to take a nap because the Shavasana was about 30 minutes long. And the teacher would tell me to relax every little bone in my body and I loved it. And it was like the slowest class and it was my favorite experience. And then I started taking yoga about seven years later as part of a scholarship dance program. And when I moved to New York, I then started taking Bikram yoga because it was where competitive dancers went to take yoga. And then I trickled into Ashtanga classes and Jiva Mukti classes. And I used to go to Om and practice with Cindy Lee and practice with Sharon and David. And then in 2004, I arrived at Laughing Lotus. And then I knew I wanted to do my teacher training there and did so in 2005 and started teaching there in 2006. And my practice has been so much part of my life for really the last, ah, how long is that? <laughs> really a deep, deep practice. It's been about 17 years. And a lot of that has been self-practice inspired by master teachers in both the vinyasa style and also the Iyengar tradition and Anusara tradition and also Katona yoga nowadays as well. My personal practice actually started because I didn't have any money. And I didn't have any money to take classes. I got lucky with my friend who had like a Bikram membership, so she just gave me this unlimited membership, but then I got tired of the heat and doing the same thing every day. So like I, I got this book called Beyond Power Yoga and I started practicing on my own and putting sequences together on my own. And then it evolved and really took me to a place, Laughing Lotus, where the, um, it, it, they celebrate the personal practice. And for me, it's been very important that I'm able to get on my mat and, and explore where the mat takes me, whether than like I have to do this many of this thing, and this many of this thing, and like, you know, you know it, it allows me to be led by the practice and also explore how my body feels different days. I mean, it's not perfect. It's not ideal. It doesn't mean that I get up and, you know, meditate for 20 minutes after oil pulling for 20 minutes and then do like 30 minutes of sun salutation. Sometimes I like do a pigeon in a handstand and sometimes I do cat cow and sometimes I get distracted and I roll up the mat but then it's just the ritual of coming back to it over and over again that it, it inspires me to stay present and the yoga practice the personal yoga practice has allowed me to confront things that are difficult or scary and just knowing that i can get on my mat and work through that stuff doesn't mean it's automatically going to be better but it gives me a place to work through personal stuff when i started vinyasa practice it was really about you know i was very young i was still dancing it was really about the fancy poses and then a few years into that like five years into that, when I did my teacher training, I tore my ACL. And it wasn't doing yoga that I tore my ACL, it was something else. And I, you know, was pushed the limits of my joints as a dancer and, you know, pushing towards hypermobility. I was already a little hypermobile as it was. And, you know, when you're dancing, they want you to just stretch, stretch, stretch. So I basically stretched out my ligaments in my knee, so it just snapped really easily. And that was the first of three knee surgeries. And I also had a back injury along the way too. And so when I realized that the practice wasn't about the fancy poses, but I still loved the exploration into the fancy poses and sort of, it's not about attaining them anymore. It's all about the process. I've even written a little bit about this in, in some articles. You know, it's not, a, and it doesn't mean that you don't practice advanced asana, it's how you approach it. It's not about actually the destination, it's about the process. And the ironic thing is that the more I see it that way, the more the practice just comes easily. You know, it does like the poses, now that they're not such a big deal, they come more readily and accessibly. And the alignment aspect, it, aspect that I'm drawn to is because I wanna be safe. I wanna be safe in my body. I, 
I love the vinyasa practice because I love what vinyasa krama means. It actually means careful step and uh, that you put care in each step. That's actually the literal translation of vinyasa krama is careful step. And we've interpreted that to mean that it means movement with the breath. I think that means that because to be full of care in each step that you put your breath in each step and to be completely conscious and aware of the moment, then that means that you have to be breathing in that moment. But I'm so interested in that careful part that we're really constructing this practice carefully, bit by bit. And I find the alignment aspect, you know, I, I'm really drawn to the Angar practice, and I'm also drawn, I mentioned, to uh, Katona practice, which is about the geometry, sacred geometry, finding these different angles in the body. Um, it's so very interesting to incorporate that into a vinyasa practice because we see that the steps along the way can be mastered when you put more care into them and the care that you put to them into them is really similar, right? So if you notice in these practices, we say that I say the same thing over and over and over again because it, it leads you through a million different poses, just one little small detail. I haven't been competitive in ages. I don't even remember like the last time I was physically competitive. Um, so that doesn't really resonate with me, even that word. I try to soften it with my students. Um, I mean, I don't think I was been competitive in my practice with myself or anyone else, probably with it for 10 years. Um, so, you know, I mean, New York is what you choose to make of it. The vinyasa practice is what you choose to make of it. It's the yoga practice is what you choose to make of it. I mean, I've seen people practice restorative yoga and hatha yoga, and they can still be jerks. You know, it just, like, and you can practice vinyasa and still be very peaceful. So I think that it's all about how you, what you put into it and what your intention is and then what you get out of it. So for the vinyasa practice, it's, Wherever you live nowadays, there's, this, there's a rapid movement, even if you get away from it. There's a rapid pace to the news cycle. There's a rapid pace to what's going on geopolitically. And there's a rapid pace in the vinyasa practice. I, I slow down a lot in my practice. I teach also some slower classes. But the idea is that you pay more attention no matter what the pace is. And you can even slow down when the pace quickens up in your own life or slow down enough to pay attention to what's really happening around you. So to bring it back to the competitive aspect, if, it's not that you're just going to stop being competitive because you make up your mind to not be competitive. It is that you have to be aware that you're competitive. Right? You have to actually make peace with that part. And that's what the practice can do. It can allow us to make peace with those different elements of who we are. And oftentimes, I think for the modern yogi, we're on a practice to kind of disassociate and like almost become, you know, feel better about our own lives and ignore what's going on outside of our own lives. And I think that you have to make peace with that and become aware of that too. And the real practice is that you become a more aware human being. And that also means that you're aware of what's going on around you. And when you're aware that you're competing with that, you might want to change it. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, physically, the alignment-wise, and I talked, you know, I taught about this in the, in the in some of the sequences, the finger spreading. And this might shed some light on that. I always corrected by master teachers, like, stop threading your thumbs, stop spreading your thumbs. She didn't tell me why. She just said to stop doing that. And like, we've been taught our whole practice, at least I've spread your fingers, hold on, Astabanda, hold on, hold on. And I realized that that was a big metaphor that, you know, we're kind of gripping onto things and it was gripping onto these poses. And, you know, you don't have to grasp so much. You can sort of let there be this conscious connectivity to the ground underneath you that allows the ground to, to give, right? Like you're, you're having a sort of constant conversation with the ground underneath you. And what happened when I stopped doing that is my, I was starting to have a wrist injury. It went away. After I researched it more, I realized that what we're doing here is pulling on our carpal ligament. And the pinky finger is not as big of a deal, but if you're doing that, it might be mirrored in the hand. So I was really surprised that I assumed that this was right, and 
I was surprised that it was so different, or at least how I, f I found a new way of being right. And that wasn't necessarily a new experience, and I think it's been an exploration of the practice that I'm always willing to, to, to change it, I'm always willing to learn something new. But I find that there's resistance to it sometimes, and there was a big resistance to that. Resistance to that. Um, mem there's been many memorable experiences. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I can't think of anything else right now <laughs> off the top of my head. That's just in my head recently because it's been such a new epiphany. Um, to uncover that, that aspect. I think community is really the one reason why I'm so drawn to Laughing Lotus and uh, the Lotus Flow is that it's always that particular kind of practice and I think it because it brings so much joy has often brought a great community together and um, you know my really great friends in life now I mean I have some from my life before I got you know went the yoga teacher path or yoga teacher path but have been from that community or from the practice community and it I think it's important and speaks to what I was talking about before that in our yoga communities, we remember that we're also here to uplift the other communities around us. Like I think that we can, everybody can kind of stick to their own kind. And I think that we teach awareness, we preach awareness, and I think it's important to also share that. And I think a lot of what I'm seeing for community these days is that it, there are more and more outreach programs and what's coming in alive in our specific communities. People are reaching out in, um, to, you know, to, to homeless. I have a lot of friends who are working with homeless students. I have a lot of friends who are working with uh, battered women. I have a lot of students who are working with prisoners and, and you know, um, going to high schools that don't really have, you know, the have the infrastructure for awareness practices and definitely not the money. And so I think that the, the importance of community in Sagna and, and in the yoga world is that we have to keep spreading and sharing and not being so preachy or dogmatic about it, but just offering the practices and allowing people to reap the benefits of it so that they then spread and share what uh, they, it has brought them. Of course, Dana Flynn really inspired me to um, be myself, and I was lucky to have her as a mentor and still have her as a mentor and friend. Um, my friend Kate Cariotti, Kate Dine Cariotti, is also a constant inspiration for me as well. We've, we've sort of traveled up the path together, even though we live on opposite sides of the country. We started out teaching together and, you know, we still do things together in trainings and just to, I'm always inspired when I meet up with her because we were just able to share in what we love and do. And then I really, you know, have a, a great, so lucky to study with so many master teachers um, Carrie Owerko and Gabrielle Halpern are two from the Iyengar tradition that I cannot stop learning from. Mati Atradi also, and um, Melissa French and Abby Galvin from Katoni Yoga are also incredibly, incredibly influential. And if you're ever in New York, you have to take Lippy Orem's class at Yoga Shanti. She's awesome. And Rodney and Colleen, yeah, I, I, I take a lot of class. I, uh, I, I um, am, I'm so inspired to learn. I never want to stop learning. So it just keeps it interesting. And some of what you see on, in these practices has come from, not like from their practices, but you know, like, you know, the, the hand, it told me to not spread my fingers. So I learned how to articulate that. Oh, how about let's try the hands equidistant? How about we move the wrists away from each other? Or 
you know, the, the back ribs moving up and the front ribs moving down was how I articulated sort of the architecture of down dog with bent knees, which is a real katona uh, yoga structure. So, you know, I learn from, they enrich the practice and then I sort of find my own way to explain it. I know my practice is working when it resonates with the students I teach it on. That's it. That's as simple as it gets. If it doesn't, if it's, if I can't see people's bodies responding to it, then I know it doesn't work.